really appreciate it. Um, contact information is there. I'm going to talk just about uh, defensive game planning uh, from a high school level. Um, listening to both Mike and Mike talk, where our hands are full uh, coaching defense these days. But um, just want to talk a few few ideas that we've come up with. I knew uh, I was going to be um, third uh, in the list today, so um, thought I'd have a little break or a little halftime. And uh, one thing that we did just recently, uh, we're all trying to figure out best ways to say thanks to our community and, and things like that. So uh, we t said thanks to our first responders um, for playing great defense, something maybe a idea that you you can do out there just to say thanks to your community. I didn't know how it would go, but um, police police department and others have said thanks for, for doing it. So uh, just an idea. So I uh, just want to give thanks to our head coach, Dave Richardson, and uh, my defensive staff, um, Brad Crandall and Chris Hole and Brad Rupnow and Ben Laxton and Sean Montgomery for helping us out. Um, like probably some of you out there, I'm the son of a coach. My dad was a Longtime coach at Grafton High School. A lot of the stuff that I'm uh, talking about tonight, I learned from him. Just methods for for scouting, um, things like that. So um, we'll just get on with it, and I'll tell you a little bit about myself and and uh, and what I learned. So this um, is a is a scouting card that uh, my dad when I was when I was a little kid. My dad was a defense coordinator at Northern Illinois University. This is about the size of a half a sheet of paper, and this was uh, scouting in the late 60s and early 70s. Um, they used these punch cards to, um, you know, they would punch out whatever the situation was, and then they'd use like an ice pick to pull these out. So my my youth of scouting was having these punch cards in our house in DeKalb, and, and my dad brought similar stuff to Grafton. Um, but a lot of what we're doing now, it, um, in scouting uh, is just borrowing from what these guys did. This My dad got this from Doc Urich, who was the head coach there. And uh, he, Doc Urich, coached with Eric Procedian at uh, at Notre Dame. And, and so you, we're just kind of connecting the dots through football history, which is an honor for all of us to coach. But, um, we are believers at Verona that um, uh, culture each strategy for lunch. Um, but you know, I don't think you find a company in the world that it doesn't have both good culture and good strategy. And I'm not a teacher in the classroom. I, I'm part owner of a civil engineering company here in, in uh, Madison. And we, we do both uh, have culture and strategy. So uh, my, my classroom is after school on the, on the football field and try to incorporate, uh, try to incorporate both. So this is um, what a printout looked like from, uh, from those scouting cards back in the seventies. Um, this is uh, what Northern Illinois did when my dad was coaching there. Um, on the left, that's what their cloud was back then. That's computer tape from the 70s that, that generated those printouts. And my dad, early on, when I was a young kid, introduced me to Bill Belichick's dad's book, uh, Steve Belichick, when he was a coach at Navy, um, football scouting methods. It was published in 1962. And um, to be quite honest, many of the columns that we use in Huddle uh, right now or just derived from what he was looking at when he was a scout and he would go to games um, back there. So uh, I would encourage you if you haven't checked that book out to check it out because there's a lot of, I mean, it's ages old, but there's a lot of valuable information. So what we did was um, just develop, a, you know, use modern technology, use Excel uh, and develop the workbook for our scouting to make it manageable in, in high school. and. Listening to Mike just now, um, I'm just fascinated with what guys are doing on offense. And um, so it's so much innovation, so much stuff that you really can't scout because they've kind of um, covered all the angles. But we're doing our damnedest on defense. I know at all levels we are. Um, but one thing I think you need to do, uh, especially in high school, is be a, as uh, economical and, if, and as efficient as possible. So I just want to walk you through what we do. Uh, at Verona, um, and I'm sure everybody out there has their their great methods, and um, I borrow I borrow from everyone as well as everybody as much as everybody else. But this is kind of where we start. Um, this is the kind of our first data collection spreadsheet that we use um, when we're getting um, information for our opponent. Um, so we just you know I, I took the opponent's name out to <laughs> protect the innocent, I guess, but we just look at um, you know 
just the core data, I'm sure as everybody does, but I've added a couple of things just um, that I can look at really early on. So you start gathering this data as the weeks lead up, but you know, just simple things like how many total uh, percentage of their total yards are from running. And in this case, um, they were 61% uh, run team, but only 43% of their total yards were from runs. So and they started to look at yards per reception and yards per pass attempt. And you realize that they were an explosive passing team. So we knew that we had to uh, protect about against explosive passes. And many teams are more becoming more 50-50, both in attempts and in, in yardage. And you realize that they're using more of the RPA, RPO short passing game versus an explosive team. And then we can look at who their um, who their players are leading them in rushing and passing and receiving. And this just gives us an early template um, and an early idea of what we're looking for. Um, one thing I've learned, like I mentioned, I'm not in the classroom, but I do have two teenagers that play for us at home uh, here, two sons that play for us here in Verona. And reading about teaching and studying um, teaching methods, you realize that you've got to really make things concise. Uh, the demands on the kids' time are, are uh, incredible these days, and I've seen it for both at home firsthand and, and with kids that we teach. So um, the other thing is kids are so in tune to video games and watching games on TV that they're often watching film like they watch a game on Saturday or they watch a video game. So what we tried to do was break things down um, into small chunks uh, of learning and really actually try to teach our players how they watch film. Um, so we took our five position groups on defense, the D-line, we're a 3-4 team, I'll get into that in a bit. Took the D-line, outside backers, inside backers, safeties and corners, and gave them each just five questions to look at. Now we answer these questions for them. We use this as a study guide. We answer these questions for them and post them on Monday. But we try to train them just how to how to look at film. For instance, the D line. We ask them, you know, do splits change based on the play type or play direction? You know, teach them what to look at. And you know, inside linebackers or a guard routine. The guards take us to the play. So that our our intent is in the in the preseason when we can watch a little bit of film with them, we can really teach them how to watch film. So that's the front of the sheet. Um, and then the back of the sheet, we just developed a few just really general questions that we try to talk through through the course of the week. But again, have them consider things like, you know, just what they did against us last year um, compared to what their run pass percentage was going into that game last year. And then what's their run pass percentage going into our game this year? So someone may be close to 50-50 run pass going into the game last year, but ran it a bit more against us. Um, than their percentage, so we try to anticipate things like that. But then we just walk them, walk our players through this through the course of the week, and this really forms the basis for our scouting report to them um, through the, through the course of the week and, and what we present uh, on huddle. So we try to again try to make things as learnable and, and economical for our, for our students or for our players as, as possible, um, and knowing that our D linemen really don't care about uh, what, what the receiver surface looks like and our, our inside linebackers don't care a whole heck of a lot about what a receiver surface may look like, but they want to know what, uh, what the backfield looks like and what happens. So we, we break things down um, by backfield type. Um, and in this case, I, I chose the kind of power spread two back team, what we look at. Um, and, and try to just give them an idea if it's king or queen, plus or minus. I'll get into that a bit, how we just tag where the tailback and fullback location is compared to the quarterback. But we, you know, try to identify some anything that's really, really big um, as far as percentages. So in this case, I highlighted, we'll highlight these when we present it to our players um, about where, you know, what, what, is, a, what is a big percentage, 84% here. 81% uh, run. So we try to look at that um, and present that to, to our interior guys. And then our um, receiver service we look at for our, our secondary and our outside linebackers. Again, not so much backfield oriented, but just what it looks like receiver service. And against this team, we were able to tell them, hey, any trips formation, whether if it's trips closed, which is with a tight end, uh, trips open, they were 100% pass. And so we try to narrow things down uh, for them in that regard. Um, 
Then we try to annotate our the huddle formation report and email that this out to them and get it posted. And, and I'll talk a bit um, about how we use a, what we call a beacon or midnight a, a indicator or opposite the indicator. But in each formation and each personnel group that we see, we try to find uh, the beacon. We we outline that here. Um, so I try to color code it. I know kids are visual these days and, and uh, the printed scouting report um, isn't much use to them. So we put all this stuff on huddle um, and we try to uh, make this as, as adaptable to their phones as, as anything else so they can look at it in little five minute segments. Um, but you can see we try to color code run pass, green and blue. We try to tag anything that's really uh, important in red. We try to um, highlight, you know, in this situation, um, what they're doing, you know, the, the majority of the plays, what they're doing, even though they're 50, 50, it's just one run and one pass. And we, um, try to try to get all this information out to them, uh, as soon as possible. But then we just break it down through the course of the week and just give them little, little snippets. But this has been helpful for us just annotating, uh, the formation report, um, through huddle. And then the next thing we do is get more detailed, um, and what I do uh, after we gather, gather all the information on Sunday night, I try to come back and annotate the huddle formation reports and then pull these into a huddle playlist, uh, just as a JPEG, as probably most of you all do, but just really try to highlight anything that, that stands out. So, um, you know, just like studying for, a, for an AP test for a kid, you, you can't give them all the information, but um, you can give them um, – you know, just, just bits and pieces of stuff that really matter and have them adaptable. So again, try to make it as visual and, and color code as possible. For instance, in this particular formation, all their runs went away from the fullback and all, almost all the passes went over uh, to the trip side and the runs were all the boundary. So just try to color code it because as a 16, 17 year old, just looking at this report, not annotated, they're going to have a hard time understanding things. So we just try to make it uh, is adaptable to them uh, and try to be as intentional as possible. So the next thing uh, we do as a staff is bring this stuff back into our workbook um, and then try to get more detailed um, about what formations look like. And for instance, we look at King uh, and Queen formations with fullback in this instance and where the tailback is located and what they're running and then break it down by down and distance uh, out of each formation and what plays they're running. And then this gets, um, what, the reason I like our format is that this is all linked up through our, um, uh, through our weekly script, through what we're doing each day, and then into our call sheet on defense. This information is in there as one of our uh, scenarios so we can be uh, specific for getting, for seeing a particular formation. We, uh, you know, we can anticipate what's going to what the offense is going to run. And this um, becomes helpful too when we pull these into a huddle playlist for the players later in the week. Uh, we can get quite specific uh, in our detail and our in our data for them what, what we're going to do. Um, of course, we do um, try to get uh, personnel specific when, offense, when we're uh, scouting an offense. Uh, we talk about, you know, any particular plays. In this instance, we knew that a particular jersey number was the ISO side of trips they were going to them on every time. And we try to try to uh, highlight that. So um, those are all things that we try to do uh, when we're presenting scouting information. Um, and, and as I said, I, I've learned more from uh, teachers uh, and how they present information to, to players, uh, you know, in the classroom. And also, going back through history. History is a great teacher. Um, and looking at how uh, intentional scouting reports when I was uh, both at playing for my dad at Grafton and playing in college at Western Michigan, um, kind of before all of this stuff, um, information was very, very detailed, but it was longer form and there probably was more time to look at it. So now we want to be just as detailed, but make it in shorter form and try to make it uh, something that our kids can look at you know, in five minutes on their telephone instead of flipping through a multi-page scouting report. Um, so kind of um, our next step is to, as I'm sure as every defensive coach does, go through uh, each formation that we anticipate seeing and just make sure that our key reads are appropriate um, and that we um, can fit things well, but also 
just so that we can define eye control um, for our players and make sure that we're telling them the right thing. So um, we just start in our base defense with everything. And um, as Mike was just talking about, or both Mikes were just talking about um, before, that, you know, offenses are, are certainly adaptable now, more so than maybe they were 10 or 15 years ago. And we're aware of that. Um, but you got to start somewhere. You got to start with your base and uh, make sure you can uh, fit things up. So we just try to make sure for our players that um, what you're looking at and what you're responsible for out of our base uh, defense. So you'll uh, start there. As I mentioned, um, you know, you try to try to define uh, run flows and run fits um, against every formation and every flow you're going to see. It's really difficult for a for a kid, 16, 17 year old, to to absorb all that information. But you want to make sure that your your base rules are uh, adaptable to what you're going to see on offense, and make sure that um, when you're translating that to your players, we want to make sure that we're uh, obviously giving them the correct information that we can fit things up right, and we're putting them in a place to succeed. And sometimes you just got to let the players play and uh, let it. Uh, play out, but we want to make sure that we're giving them the best chance that we can with assignments. One thing that we um, really, uh, I'll spend a bit of time with this, one thing that we've really focused on is the top line here. These are all of our play call tags, so uh, we can slant or blitz to, uh, I'm sure like everybody else, uh, any particular tag. So a couple things that we've done um, that have been helpful for us is We've used a formation indicator that we call beacon and the opposite of that is midnight. So in a particular formation, if I just go back and stuff, in this per particular formation, we may find that the fullback is the indicator. And I know uh, Mike, the first Mike that spoke talked about the counter tray play that they use. They, so you can't key the fullback and, and uh, it's, it's smart offense and we're well aware of the fact that you can do it, but you gotta play the percentages on on defense, so we may say that in this formation, the the indicator is the is fullback. So if we want to tag a blitz to run to run that blitz or slant to the fullback, we call that beacon. And if we want to do something to the backside, we call that midnight. It's just away from the lighthouse. So that uh, helps us. And then we've we debated. Uh, as probably many of you defensive coaches out there. Uh, we we constantly get into this. Or we did constantly get into this debate. Uh, of offensive strength and weakness. Um, and for instance, uh, uh, we would debate, is this the strong side or is this the strong side? So finally we realized the obvious and said, well, there's, there's a heavy and light side for run strength and there's a strong and weak side for pass strength. So we would call this the heavy side because it has more attached blockers. And we would call this strong because it's passing strength. Um, and that, you know, it seemed obvious talking about it now, but it was helpful to us too. And so we break down in our huddle columns, we, we identify both uh, heavy, uh, heavy and light and strong and weak sides in any formation and try to get a, a beat on that. And then the other stuff is pretty typical, tight end and uh, back and hash and back and things like that. So how are we gonna run a blitz? We are, um, so just a little bit of background. Um, my, as I mentioned, I played for my dad, who he was a uh, GA at the University of Michigan during the transition from Bumpa Elliott to Bo Schembechler, and that was a big Michigan's 50 defense, uh, was what we did. Um, you know, my dad brought forward all the way to his time at Grafton, taught me, and then when I played at Western Michigan, uh, we were a 50 defense, and I, you know, spent time learning about the 50 defense which has now become the 3-4. Um, and, and as Mike uh, talked about in the first session, um, you know, the, the tight front or the four eyes have become, have become the thing. And so we get to that in a couple different ways, as I'm sure every, everybody out there running 3-4 does. But the thing that I uh, really borrowed from the, um, from the Michigan slant and angle defense uh, back in the day and brought all the way forward is just the, the concept of movement. Um, and so we look at how we can bring the movement against different formations and how we can do it. So what I wanted to do here is just kind of show you our base movement. We call it zap um, and how we can do it with a tag from the field if we're bringing that pressure from the field. So everything we consider is, is a pressure. Um, so if we're bringing a pr pressure from the field, the ball is in the middle of the hash. If we wanted to bring it to the midnight side, of, you know, it looks the same, but it's just a different call. 
um, and, and how we uh, how we line things up. So I will show a bit of film here if we have some time um, when I'm done. Um, but that's how, how um, things would look in our in our slant and angle game and our um, in what we're doing. Um, we always were going to look at a couple pressures. I put a couple up here. Um, my uh, idea of pressure is to try to get the uh, most offensive lineman uh, blocking nothing as possible, blocking air. And um, both um, Mike uh, in, in the first session and Mike in the second, especially Mike in the se second session, talked about how quick passes come right now. You don't have time to get pressure on a quarterback if you're going to be messing around with an offensive lineman. So we look at a couple ways uh, to get pressure on the um, on the on the quarterback in quick fashion, and it's just alignment, maybe some key reads, but it's really this simulated pressure uh, concept that's become so in vogue right now. Um, just our, our our way of doing it. So um, those are a couple pressures we look at, um, and I'll show film on that here just in a second. Um, I do want to talk about a couple things um, aside from scouting. That I always try to you know try to take a couple nuggets from everyone I listen to and a couple things that have been really helpful to us uh, on the left is our is kind of our weekly to-do list for from a coaching standpoint I know it's difficult probably difficult to read um, but what I've done is break things down for what we're doing in preseason um, and who was responsible for it and then in season it just walks us through each day as far as scouting like who is responsible to do what and when we want it done so there's no um, you know, there's no misconceptions about who's responsible for what and, and when it's supposed to be done. So this has been helpful to us. Um, and I think a couple of guys in the defensive staff are listening and they can probably voice their opinion too, but it's been helpful to us just to kind of lay out expectations. The, uh, the thing on the, on the right here has probably saved us more headaches in the last couple of years than anything else. Um, oftentimes you talk about a player, um, and I took this from my, my company, that. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, I'm part owner of. Sometimes you're talking about an employee who, like, you worry about our, you know, their salary expe expectations different than what we're giving them, or job title or whatever. So I kind of brought that to um, to our to our football team and just ask. We ask every player a couple times during the season, maybe every other week or every third week, just to fill this out. Put your name down, and assuming a you know a game has 60 defensive plays how many plays they think they're going to play, they should play in each of these games, in a varsity game, in a JV game, close game, a blowout. Because so many times in my coaching career, I've worried about, oh, my God, this kid's probably really, really mad. He thinks he should be playing more. And then you come to realize, well, he doesn't. But we try to have these conversations ahead of time um, and just ask him to fill this out. So, you know, if a kid that's third team fills out the top line and he, that he thinks he should play 40 plays in a, in a close varsity game, well, we got to have a conversation, but at least it allows you to have the conversation. And vice versa, you think, well, a senior who's been a great program kid, we got to get him more snaps, and he puts down five plays in a close varsity game, he gets it. And and then you don't have, you're, you're spending time in your staff meetings worrying about stuff you shouldn't worry about. So that's been helpful to us um, and something you might want to consider. The other thing um, that we've spent a lot of time on this winter um, is is just looking at the stats that matter um, and what, what – um, is an indicator of, um, you know, how we're going to do against the game. So I dug back uh, from 2019 all the way back to 2011 and kind of gathered a really a bunch of data, I think it was about 90 columns wide, and started looking at differentials. And you can see them at the top here, just rush yardage differential and on down the thing. And then we realized we wanted to look at things that incorporate uh, differentials that incorporate all three phases of the game. So offense and defense and special teams. And the, what I mean by differential is just the difference be, from our team to theirs. And we started looking at a couple data points um, and we came up or I came up with um, this data point um, of points per play, how many points you're scoring per play. And, you know, obviously you're not scoring, it's, it's tenths of a point, but we found we did this uh, kind of, analysis of it and we found that we're winning games when we're averaging about two tenths of a point uh, per play more than our opponent which makes sense if you look at a high school game each team gets about eight series you get about two tenths of a point per game that puts you up about a touchdown and and it's kind of uh, decent but it's something that we're uh, able to 
keep track of during the course of a game and then share with our kids like, hey, we just got to we got to be efficient. It's a model of efficiency. It's a model of field position. It's a model of defensive efficiency not to defend points, not yards. And it's a model of our offense. Hey, when you get a chance to score, let's go score. Um, so that, uh, that's been helpful to us. Just a couple of nuggets you may want to look at. Um, so with that, uh, Sam, do I have time just to run a little bit of film? Is that all right? You should. Yeah, you're good. Okay. Uh, just a couple film clips. Um, so, um, sorry. So this is uh, base defense here. Just want to show you. We're as I mentioned, we're a three-four team. Um, kind of the the invoke thing, the Rip Liz uh, deal. We call it rocking and laser, but just how we're running. So this is our this is our high safety. We're playing um, you know, our version of match uh, match three. Starting in a too high alignment, dropping our safety down. We're not slanting here. We're just playing out of four eyes, just how it looks. We get pretty aggressive on our, our run fit with our safety, but he's our secondary force guy. Um, so that's just kind of how we fit it up against the formation that we're, we were talking about here. This is um, uh, Tripp's formation or with the tight end. We're in four eyes there. You can see the safety rock down. And that's how that fits. Um, so this next couple of clips are is our slant and angle game. So again, but this safety's down too early. He's just kind of indicating what what's going on too early. But you can see our slant game. So the front side really just p plays a five. The back side, uh, the nose and the back side end are ripping and slanting through. Um, again, this is a, a beacon call. And I'll show it from the end zone clip. You can see our nose. What we really, you know. Again, through scouting, we felt like we had a pretty good beat on what was going on. And you can see our nose slant through and run kind of an average kid with good, great effort. And with support on the edge, we're able to force the ball back into him. Things work out. Here's a, a pass clip of it. Um, again, slanting, dropping the safety down behind it. Pretty simple stuff, you know, pretty um, uh, economical use of, of, of defense, but just um, looking too high, and he sits and just waves, pads his feet, and um, steps in front of it. So that's um, how things play out. You can see um, just ripping inside and just dropping the safety down um, has been good for us. This is what I want to talk about, the, the um, our, our idea of pressure. We do, when we get a situation where we can pressure this is third and seven, um, we try to look. Like we bring a lot, and sometimes we do bring a lot, and other times we don't. This is a case where we back everybody out because of a big screen game that we've been hurt by screens in the past. We only rush two, um, but this is the idea: is to get as many offensive linemen blocking air as possible um, and bring pressure there. So that's that's our intention. Spin forward, and know I'm running out of time. This is just a different way of doing it. We're just to show a four-man front, um, but we try to draw attention with our nose. You'll see the guard here just watching film, scouting before. We knew that um, they like to make sure that the center was, was taken care of to have a guard with them. So we did some things there, and then we knew we could get inside. So we're just a three-man rush. But, again, as many uh, guys blocking air as possible um, was our intent there. And then, um, yeah, here, it just the kind of gratuitous one at the end. But, again, showing a lot of pressure. And in this case, we only bring one, um, but we kind of knew how we could do it. We back everybody else out and cause a fumble. So it's just, again, the, uh, the idea of um, trying to bring pressure where, where they're not going to block and get as many, uh, as many uh, offensive linemen blocking there as possible. So um, that's what I have, uh, fellas. So uh, any, any questions, I'm happy to answer. Yeah, we got a few. We got a bunch here. Okay. Uh, first one is, is how long did it take you to come up with these templates? <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's a fair question. I'm down here in my basement uh, with my wife and my kids like to put me, but no, uh, um, one thing I do, as I mentioned, uh, you know, I, I'm a part owner of a civil engineering company. And one thing I do have access to is a lot of really, really smart people, not myself, but others who are really adept at, uh, Excel as well as spreadsheets. So uh, about 10 years ago, um, I knew that we really needed to, I felt like we needed to revamp what we were doing. 
So I just kind of dug in. I sat down with a bunch of engineers who have no interest in football, and they and I said I need to know how to do this. And they kind of gave me a really good lowdown. So it took me a winter um, to, to lay it out. And now our special teams and offense, I kind of did thing, you know, did the template for them as well. And and we're all using it, and it's it's quite helpful. So, yeah, I'm I'm happy to share or whatever. You know, like my email and stuff is on there. I'm happy to walk people through it. it it's been you know for us. Uh, it's helpful. I can only imagine, like Mike talking before from Carol, what those guys go through at the college level. But, um, you know, high school, we're all trying to be as, as efficient as possible. I'm not a big fan of, of, of simple, um, you know, keep it simple. I'm more of a fan of being economical, and, and that's allowed us to be economical. So, sorry, long-winded answer your question. I apologize. Oh, you're good. Um, next one along with that is, and how long does it typically take you to fill out all your – columns temp and all your templates that you have yeah yeah um what has really helped is our is that to-do list or you know we really try to break it up and i, I hope those guys are listening here because the assistance on our staff i owe a whole load of gratitude too because we all try to break it up we um we, we don't meet a, a lot on the weekend we do meet uh, on sunday evenings um as a defensive staff or sunday late afternoon and evenings um and I, you know, I try to give everybody about, you know, they're probably going to chuckle, but probably about four hours of work outside of those meetings on the weekend. To, to, and everyone just fills out parts. And then, so we get together on Sunday evenings and we're done usually about 10 o'clock. And then, uh, you know, then I kind of come home and, and wrap it up. So it's, I don't think it's more than what other people are doing. I mean, it, we're all, you know, exhausted by the end of the season, but it's kind of, kind of the thrill of it. So I guess to answer your question, you know, it varies on who we're playing, but it may be like 10 hours over the course of the weekend, 10 to 12 hours over the course of the weekend for all of us. But that's, yeah, all right. And the last part to this question is how long does it take uh, your players? Um, it says you can answer. It says as you can. So does it ever get graded? Could you repeat? I, I, sorry, I couldn't hear you. Oh, my bad. Uh, so it says how long does it take to players? Um, it says you can answer as your ability, does it ever get graded? Oh, does it ever get graded? No. Uh, we've toyed with, um, you know, kind of doing the quizzes. I've heard guys talk about, especially this winter, uh, during this virus, you know, the whole virus and all these webinars and everything, I've heard guys talk, really some really neat ideas about um, you know, Thursday quiz and things like that. We don't grade it. We do um, spend Thursdays kind of talking through it with our position groups like Chris or Chris and Sean, our D-line coaches. They'll just kind of go through those questions just to double check. Um, so I, I'm not sure if that answers the question or not. We don't really grade it. We ask that, I know it's nice, to, what's nice now and who knows what's going to happen this season, but those first couple games in the scrimmage are before school starts. So, um, you know, kids are able to get together and kind of work through the study guide and it's the excitement of the season, things like that. And they work through the study guide for those first couple of games. Now, when we get into the school year, like I said, we post that information. I don't want them spending time on the weekends doing this. They have schoolwork and stuff. And, you know, um, they, they got to be doing that first. But we, we, we use those, the scrimmage in the first couple of games to really try to teach them how to watch film and address the questions on the study guide. So I hope that answers the question. Yep, it does. All right, that's it. So thanks for talking. Sure, yeah, and uh, as I said, um, guys, listen, if you have any, like to share anything, I'm sure I could learn from you all, so um, please feel free to contact me on uh, phone or email or Twitter or whatever, whatever you got. Thank, uh, thanks again, um, Sam and Bobby, for doing this. We really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for coming on, Coach. That was awesome. A lot of really good stuff in there. Great. I'll stop sharing here. All right, and last up, we got Coach Chad Henning.